Rose and I did not consult about our outfits. It's purely <laughs> coincidental that we, we are in sync here. Um, I, this is a kind of taste of, of what I do. And in terms of books, I'm best known for writing huge tomes. Um, the wine grapes one up there weighs uh, seven pounds or three, the same kind of weight as a newborn baby um, and is about uh, a thousand pages long. Ditto, really, the Oxford Companion to Wine, which is everything a wine geek or nerd or student needs to know. Um, and the World Atlas of Wine is pretty thick and pretty heavy. But my latest book, this one in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, £4.99. <laughs> and it's only 100 pages, so it's a big departure. And Rose... Um, our 25-year-old daughter played a major part in its genesis. And so, oh, by the way, isn't, is there a famous egg timer that's going to tell us how, we, how we're getting on? Thank you. Um, so, Rose. Poor Rose lost her voice completely yesterday. Now has a very sexy growl, but <laughs> we mustn't make her talk too much. But I want her to talk about the genesis of the 24-hour wine expert. Well, um, ironically, this book did come out for me talking too much. Um, my friends always said, oh, your mum's a wine writer, you know about this. Oh, your mum's a wine writer, you pick the wine, you know what's going on, what should I do with this? And I realised that I just didn't know because mum's books, when as much as a newborn baby, were rather impenetrable and just never actually got around to reading any of them. So <laughs> I decided... <laughs> Um, I wanted to write a book for all my friends and to answer all these questions and gathered all my friends together and actually wrote down all the questions they had and what they wanted to know. It was um, a kind of brainstorming exactly, session, wasn't it? Yeah. Fueled with my wine tasting leftovers. Exactly, <laughs> as so many of my evenings are. Um, <laughs> and the questions that came out, I think, actually really interested mum and was something we were going to work on. And unfortunately, I then started working somewhere else. Didn't have time to move on with that project. But then mum got a very interesting opportunity a little down the line. Yes. Um, then what I was in the, the throes of writing the, or editing, the fourth edition of the Oxford Companion to Wine, when Holland's best-known wine writer, Hubrecht Dijker, who has published 117 books on wine, making me, my output look extremely puny, contacted me and said he'd had great success with a book called Wine Expert in a Weekend in Dutch, and he'd like to produce an English language version of it with me, and that he would translate and send me the text. And I said, I'm sorry, Hubrecht, but I'm just so busy doing this Oxford Companion thing, I just don't have time to even think about this. Anyway, I came out of the Oxford Companion uh, purda and read his uh, text and thought, mm, I'm not sure really about this. It was very much targeted at, at an older readership um, and it had sort of coupons in the back for um, get a sort of cheap wine from you know, the local chain wine store and things like that. Um, but I did like the idea that a little book could teach people to become a wine expert, not to be a wine nerd, not to be somebody who is absolutely mad about it. But when I thought about it, I realized that actually there are far more people in the world who like drinking wine and just want to know the basics. They don't want all this stuff. Uh, so I realized that there was definitely a market for Wine Expert in. And so I thought, if I take Rose's um, question, Rose's, the points from Rose's brainstorm of what people want to know, uh, I, I could write from scratch, I think, a fairly decent guide to, a well-informed guide to just the basics and the practical stuff of what you need to know, not going into massive detail about which way the vineyard faces and all that kind of thing, but glasses and bottles and what you do in a restaurant when somebody pours you 
a little tasting sample. And price, everybody wants to know what's overpriced, what's underpriced, all that kind of thing. So I spent the summer of 2015 um, actually writing it. And everybody says to me, when they, my wine writing friends, when they see this tiny, tiny little paperback, penguin paperback, say, how did you get the whole of the Oxford Companion to wine into just 100 <laughs> pages? And of course, that's not the point at all. The point is to start off with somebody with a wine glass or uh, at home or at a restaurant table and, and as I say, just, just the basics and the essentials of what they need to know from my, I'm afraid, 40 years. Coming up on December the 1st is Thursday, right? 41 years on Thursday um, uh, experience of writing about wine. So it does, you know, it's not just any old person having a go at, at what to do about wine. I do have a little bit of background there. But I learned a lot doing this book because my editor at Penguin, Cecilia Stein, was the absolute target market. Very intelligent uh, but, and really enjoyed drinking wine but didn't know anything about wine. So she would ask me questions which just completely floored me, you know, took me right back to basics. I'm sure all of you here is an expert in some field and suddenly someone who, who doesn't know what your field is, asks you a question about something that you took for granted years and years ago that makes you rethink everything. So she was, for instance, saying, well, I don't understand the difference between vintage and age. That was one thing I remember. Um, vintage is the, the year of the wine, and we also talk about the vintage as being the process of harvesting it. But age is how many years the wine has existed, if you like. Um, I'm sure she said all, and then she got very confused about how you make, what the difference between red wine and white wine is, and pink wine. Um, and of course, you make red wine, you can only make red wine from grapes that are dark skinned, because you're leaching the color from the, 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 the skins of the grapes. If you want to make a pink wine, you leach the color for a short time, so you just make it pink. Um, to make a white wine, you ideally use, usually use pale-skinned grapes, but you can actually make a white wine from dark-skinned grapes if you very quickly separate the juice of the grape from the skin. Because if you think about it, if you cut open a grape, no matter what color the skin, the flesh inside is all a kind of greeny-gray color. So if you separate the, that juice from the greeny-gray color from the skins very quickly, as you do, say, in champagne, that's how you make champagne from dark-skinned grapes, um, you can make a white wine from dark-skinned grapes. So, to recap, <laughs> to make a red wine, you need dark-skinned grapes. To make a pink wine, you need dark-skinned grapes. To make a white wine, it doesn't really matter so long as you follow the basic rules. Um, so, Ro, we'll, we can go on about various um, aspects of this, but uh, I would like perhaps to show some of my favorite bits from the book, which is, for instance... Um, well, this is actually one of my favorite bits. Okay. And <laughs> I, um, I think Mum loves learning what the questions were and going back to the beginning, but I actually love being able... I've seen my mum write. Probably my earliest memory is mum and her laptop. Uh, uh, side view. <laughs> yes, exactly. My mum's profile staring at her computer. Um, but I never felt that connected to what she was writing. And then when I read her articles in the paper, I would s see her style and get her personality and not when I read her books. And this was one of the prime examples of where I saw her coming out. And this was probably my favourite part of the whole book, which... <laughs> If I've heard mum say Perlis once, I've heard her say Perlis at least 5,000 times. And to be able to see her put her personality in that book was one of my favourite things about seeing her write this and writing it with her. Well, it is true that sweet wines are wildly misunderstood. People think that sweet wines are kind of bad in some way, um, mainly because commercial wine is sweetened up because when people start drinking wine, they tend to have started off with soft drinks. And so they, the, the people who make really cheap wine put a bit of sugar in to sort of say, it's nearly Coca-Cola, but <laughs> not 
quite. Um, so we all think that wine has to be bone dry to be sophisticated. But actually, uh, insiders in wine all absolutely love really sweet wines. And a good sweet wine has enough fresh acidity to counterbalance the sweetness. So it's not cloying at all. And I, for instance, enjoyed meals where there has you've drunk nothing but sweet wine, and the sweet wine has gone really well with every single course, and energizes you because it's sort of fresh on the end. What's the next slide, Rose? I was going to say, I also do know quite a few men who like rosé, so they were very pleased about this particular slide as well. Yes, I bet. <laughs> well, I'm afraid Jeremy Clarkson um, is, a, <laughs> is a big rosé fan. <laughs> anyway, I'm not, I won't go there. Um, yeah, practical stuff. Um, I was very keen to dispel the myth, much promulgated by wine glass producers, that you need a separate glass for every wine. You don't even need a different glass for uh, whites or reds. There's no logic to having a smaller glass for whites than, than reds. And actually, nowadays, the, the top champagne producers are all saying we'd much rather have our wine served in regular wine glasses, like the ones on your table, rather than the tall, thin ones, because they want you to be able to smell. The most important thing about a wine is its smell. That's its flavor. And they want you to be able to properly smell it, rather than from these th uh, glasses that are tall and thin and have a very small aperture at the top. And the top producers of fortified wines, like sherry and port, are also saying, we want you to use a really normal glass for our wines, too, so you can sense them. So honestly, you just need one size of wine glass and preferably um, this kind of shape that goes in towards the top so that you can swirl it around to get the maximum aroma and it's not going to fall out. Um, we should move on, Rose, because I'm looking at the egg timer. What's that? What? Oh, yes, I like that. What your choices say about you. Um, Prosecco, Rose, fun, extrovert, unfussy. <laughs> Champagne, sybaritic, I won't go through them all. Um, but I'm afraid wine in heavy bottles means you're a marketing victim. Um, the, 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 the weight of a wine bottle is no measure of its quality, and there are an awful lot of not very good wines put into heavy bottles. Um, what's that? Uh, uh, have we got an, oh, what's, next. Yes, next one. So, uh, oh, yes. Yeah. So mum was in profile, sitting at her laptop for most of this, but I had chosen this particular time of mum's writing to take a train trip around Europe. So I was mainly sitting in third class train carriages, <laughs> reading manuscripts on my, um, on my phone and sending notes like this back to mum, in which she had paired a certain wine with beef tea. And I said, unfortunately, no one uses the term beef tea. I only know it from the railway children. Maybe you should use a different word. <laughs> Yeah, Sorry. Rose was very good at keeping me on the straight and narrow and, uh, you know, pointing out which locutions I was <laughs> using would not mean anything to the target market. Um, so, I was... Uh, I'm very, very pleased with how it's gone. came out last February. It's in its eighth printing, although we all know that publishers nowadays are very cautious in the number of copies that they commit to printing, um, and it has gone into the most amazing number of co-editions, uh, 25 at the last count, that uh, including, amazingly, uh, well, Thailand was quite surprising, but I, to me, the most surprising is Kazakhstan, which I, but I, I, we all know they're making a lot of money in Kazakhstan, it's nice to know they're spending it on wine. Um, we don't have any questions, do we, in, the, in this session? Because um, I, I love talking about what people want to know as opposed to spouting on. Um, Rose, you have looked at Amazon, haven't you? And yes. 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 No, I'd, well, I don't usually like to give mum too many compliments because she <laughs> is constantly praised by everyone. <laughs> but um, I do love showing her the Amazon reviews, which my favourite was a three-star one that said... Very good, but not as good as the Oxford Companion to Wine, which <laughs> is probably a very good review of this book, actually. Um, but it was a pleasure to work with Mum on it, and it's mm. actually a pleasure to get all my questions answered, and I hope that you will buy it and have all of your questions answered as well. And we've finished early. There we go. Is that all right? Thank you.